We're going to really praise the Lord this morning. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We thank you for your presence that's already in the house. You said true worshipers would worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we, we come to hear the truth of your word and to enjoy your holy presence. And we thank you for welcoming us into your presence through the finished work of Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, we worship you. Amen.
forward to the day. I said I wasn't going to. I can't help it. I'm sorry. I don't apologize. I look forward to the day when we can't pick up a telephone in here, text anyone back, that we get so messed up in Jesus that we don't even care, that we fall out on our faces because of the glory of God. And nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. We won't think about anything because his glory will be so great. Woo! I'm looking for that day, that moment, we lose ourselves in him.
For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Mom and Dad used to sing, When I think of the goodness of Jesus, has done for me. You know my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Sing it again. Now when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me. Dismiss the children's church. Middle school, high school, stay in here with the old people. <laughs> Woo. I don't know about you, but I can just go on with that. Hallelujah. What a mighty God. So, how many years have been since you went to Westland? About 18, 19 years ago, a little skinny college kid with an afro started coming to this church. And some crazy things has happened since then. When Jesus said, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and commanding them to observe all the things I've commanded you to observe and teach. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That kid took it seriously. Before I give you the mic, give him the mic, I want you to see a video that came across the Zambian news networks of what God is doing in Zambia in that part of Africa and all over Africa. Traditional leaders are the custodians of culture and the country's moral fiber. This is why government attaches great importance to the role these leaders play in curving a sustainable future for the country. Overland Missions in Zambia is working tirelessly to transform not only the image, but the real life stories of chiefs in Zambia. Located about 10 kilometers from Livingston town and nestled in a serene natural setting of Rapid 14 in Songwe village is Overland Missions Zambia headquarters. Let's now understand how the organization is working with chiefs in Zambia. 
So Oberlin Missions um, has always focused on remote and unreached people groups. That's, that's our DNA, that's our ethos for why we exist in nations all over the world. And because of that, we have found ourselves time and time again meeting up with traditional leaders who live in these remote places. And over the years, God has really birthed a very unique relationship with those leaders, uh, originally beginning with Chief Chipepo many years ago, uh, where he and I met each other in a ceremony at uh, the Nyawa Chiefdom and began to share just our passions and, and what we're doing and found that our visions really came together uh, very beautifully in our desire to reach traditional leaders with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a reason why the, the body of Christ and the local church and the mission movement should always come together and work together. And the reason for that with traditional leaders is I didn't come into Zambia with preconceived ideas about chiefs. I wasn't raised seeing on television channels that the, the chiefs are the epicenters of witchcraft or any of those things. That wasn't programmed into my mind. I saw that these were men who had great authority and, had, um, and they were the doorway to remote and unreached people. So for Overland Missions and for the entire team, for Phil Smethurst and, and, and the CEO of our organization, our emphasis was always honor existing leadership and God will open doors through that, through that honoring of, of those leaders. So it was easy for us to honor them at the beginning, and it was so easy to see how they carry such an important dynamic to this nation as fathers and mothers of the nation. October 2022, Overland Missions hosted an event for kings and queens from all over the world. President Hakainde Hichilema graced the event, which was dubbed a historic gathering of our time. We find out more. The beginning of last year, uh, we sat down with several of the traditional leaders, Chief Chapepa, Chief Ashima, Chief Kaputa, and we talked about what it would look like to gather all of the Zambian chiefs together. And um, not only did we gather all of the chiefs of Zambia, but we had 36 countries represented of kings and queens of Africa that came together for a gospel event, first of its kind, called the King of Kings Celebration, where we honored existing kings of the earth, which the scripture does honor existing kings, and at the same time, recognize that there is a King of Kings. And it was a worship event, incredible. We had Pompey and Esther, we had Rachel, we had um, Ephraim, son of Africa, and, and, and many others invest in that time from a worship component. And then we just preached the word of God and we shared with them the vision of God for this generation through these traditional leaders and how God wants to really impart his vision and, and his wisdom and his love to the continent of Africa. It was massively successful. Um, and, and it has opened the door for, I believe, God to move in a significant way throughout the entire continent. If the traditional leadership is this important, then incorporating the Word of God in its rulership should be a natural undertaking. Chief Chipepo was one of the first traditional leaders that I met. I just assumed that many of them love the Lord. I mean, he is so passionate for the things of God. He has a very unique story himself. And it was Chief Chipepa who introduced me to most of the traditional leaders of Zambia. We would travel from palace to palace, preach the gospel, share the vision of God. And, um, and so I would say after 15 years of that kind of movement and momentum, um, the chiefs of Zambia are some of my closest friends. They're the people that I've, I've, I've personally been able to invest in um, from time to time when they gather. And, um, and, and I see the move of God in Zambia a massive component of that move is going to happen through the traditional leaders, not only of this nation, but also of the entire continent. Reporting for Morning Live, I'm Mary Mukisa. Amen. Y'all make Brother Jake welcome this morning. I got it. Check, check. There we go. Praise God. Good morning, church. Um, I had told Pastor Jerry uh, it had been 18, 19 years since I graduated. It had been 23 years since I sat in this church. And I will tell you that um, I was raised to love the things of God, and, and, I, and I knew Jesus, and I loved the Lord. And you all know, many of you know my testimony of how, you know, high school was, was really a lot of compromise and me running from the Lord. Um, and I'll tell you, without question, just sitting here... Um, the thing that I grabbed a hold of and began to understand, and I would say the thing that I was radically exposed to that changed my life here in, these, in this church was the anointing. Amen. It was the anointing of God. And, and, 
And how many of you know, you know, we can, man can do his effort, but without the anointing, without the presence of God, it does not matter. It does not matter. And I sit and I watch, you know, this video very humbly because look at me. I, I, I am not an impressive guy in the flesh. I don't have a lot to offer. I have met so many of these kings. And when they've met me, the, the renown of Pastor Jacob, you know, and they look at me and they're like, we're so disappointed. We thought you would be a big man. We thought you would, you know, we thought you'd have this booming preacher voice. And we, we expected so much more in the flesh. And I'm just so thankful our God does not operate through flesh. He doesn't operate through the ways of the world and the things that I learned in this church as I sat and learned to covet and cherish and honor above everything else the presence of God that's meant everything for the last 23 years of my life it has carried me it has broken open doors it has established the word of God and the ways of God and the kingdom of God into nations uh, you know all over the globe um I'm so sad my wife and kids aren't here today. We so rarely come. Uh, I so rarely come here without them. We are in the States right now for a few months, um, and they're planted in Florida where we have a home uh, that we return to about four months a year. And because of our responsibilities overseeing the global work, we were called to come back uh, yearly to be able to manage what's going on in Central and South America as well as North America. Um, but when our family joined, Overland Missions was uh, 10 staff. We were in Zambia. Uh, Philip Smethers, the, the guy you would have seen there, you know, kind of breaking ground and whatnot, he's the CEO and founder of our organization. And he had a huge dream, and he had traveled the world himself, but he couldn't wait to see God you know, establish our team uh, across the nations. And in many ways, we came alongside him and said, hey, you carry the big dream and the big vision. We'll be the guys on the ground to, to, to do the work and to believe God to establish it. And um, what started out as a work in Zambia has, at this point, we're uh, 350 staff strong. We're in 25 countries around the world, four continents. And, uh, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense, it, truly. It... Um, I think back on, you know, the, the, the amount of times, I mean, I don't know, those of you who remember me in those days, I was at this altar every week. Because I recognized that I had to get all ambition and selfishness out of me so that God could be who I know he is in me. And, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't a show. It wasn't, it wasn't, and maybe initially it was me being guilty and, and running into the same wall week after week, but I'm so thankful that God has trained me in, in the word and has trained me in, in, in his finished work and what he's done because church, I want to talk to you this morning about the posture of faith. And I want to talk to you about what it looks like when Jesus has apprehended your life. And when his word has apprehended your life, where you are no longer allowing your circumstance and your experience to be revered above his very word. There comes a place where you have to look at circumstance and situation and experience and say, this is not lining up with what the word of God says over my life and therefore I have to go to war. And going to war is faith. It's the posture of faith. It's the presentation of faith. It's what we do day in and day out. And in many ways, you know, when, when, when you see anything on the news, you know, typically, or when, when a missionary comes, they're going to celebrate the highs because that's what you do when you get a lot of people together. Let's talk about the successes. Let's talk about the breakthrough and all that God's done. I wish we could have like some fireside chats and I could just talk to you about the labor <laughs> required and, 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 and make it sometimes that's the story that connects, right? I mean, it's hard to look at Kings and go, how does that translate to me? How does that translate to my walk, my story, what I'm battling through? But it's the same exact thing. I mean, we, we walk through the same kind of battles and it's the, it, the, I hate to use the word recipe, but, but to be led by the spirit is the same for each and every one of us and to be governed by the word of the Lord. Um, 2022 was the King's event, so I went into 2023 with more of a rigorous schedule than I'd ever set, um, which is saying a lot because I've run very hard for the last 15 to 20 years. 
Um, and in May, uh, I was playing some soccer. May of this last year, 2023, I played soccer at Wesleyan. I still, in my head, think that I'm the same 20-year-old guy. My body is not cooperating with that narrative, and I can't quite seem to find the word to support my, my, uh, my faith approach with it. Uh, considering the fact, anyways, uh, I, I, I made a small turn for the ball. No one touched me, and my left leg ceased to, <laughs> to be what it was. it was. It was total collapse and failure. My plantar tendon, my calf muscle split down the middle, my, my um, uh, Achilles, uh, it, was, it was a major, major injury. And so as of May, uh, I was flown to South Africa and was on crutches. And it, the whole course of the year went from me visiting all of the kings and dignitaries that came to the event to break open what God's doing in those nations to me, you know, kind of crutching around at Rapid 14. Um, I also had needed a, a, I'd had some really bad reflux for years, knew I needed a hernia surgery. So I thought, well, great time to just get it done. Might as well just knock it out. Everyone gets hernia surgeries. I had no idea how bad that thing was going to hit me. So I went down to South Africa, got the surgery, five holes in my stomach. They stretched my stomach around the diaphragm, staple it too. I mean, it was a massive thing. It's changed the way I swallow and eat and all these things. So what I'm saying is this last year was hard. And in the midst of all of that, God began to deal with me on, on leaven and on things in my life that I just allowed through the, through the pace and through the, the movement. And I went from like top of the mountain, like championing the kings of Africa to like about as low as I've ever been this last year, truly. I would call it like my dark night of the soul. It was it was tough. And when you hit that wall sometimes in life, and when you, when you come to that place, even though you've preached passionately for 23 years of your life, and you've been the, pe the person to lead people in the posture of faith, you're in, you're in the storm now. The test is on you. And are you going to let circumstance and situation and everything that's, that's coming on you to define the narrative of your life, to define who you are, to define uh, the promise of God for you. Are you going to get back in the war, word and go to war? Amen. And um, man, I had, to, I, I had to face off with some things this year. And um, at the end of the day, here I am, <laughs> standing strong, excited and ready for 2024, um, ready to run with my wife and kids, full on ready to, to engage as well. My oldest child's 18 now. I've got a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. My 11-year-old last week in Summit PA um, led a full set of worship for the first time on drums with our team. And not like kids play worship. I mean, anointed, going for the thing. So like, I mean, some of the highest excitement of, of a father is seeing your kids passionately pursue the things of God. There's actually nothing greater than that. Um, and, and so I just felt like in the midst of what the devil really attempted to do and taken me out last year in some ways, um, not just physically, but my heart, my mind, um, of, of course, God used to stabilize, reinforce, and I will be more radical and, and committed to that posturing of faith and the presentation of the gospel uh, than I've ever been in my life. And it's not because of anything I possess outside of Jesus Christ. He truly um, is the way, the truth, and the life. He truly has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Amen. John chapter 19 makes it very clear. It was referenced already this morning. But when Jesus said, it is finished, church, he meant it. And my preaching has become so consumed with the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you hear me preach anywhere in the world, you'll say, oh, that message sounded a lot like the last one I heard. Well, it hasn't changed a lot in the last 15 or so years because I just can't get past the facts on the table that Jesus has paved the way, has finished the work, and that it doesn't only apply. It does apply to my forgiveness and the removal of sin as far as the east is from the west, but it also has empowered me to be a living epistle to this earth today. Amen. It has given me everything I need for life and godliness. It has equipped me. It has established me on every level, in every way. 
And that is your message. It's not just my message. It's not just my word. It's the promise of God to everyone who would believe. And we have to understand how to take the promise of God and, and see that it's, it's actualized in our life. That it's not something we say we believe, you know, because it's easy to sing the songs. I mean, we've all sang, we've all, you know, we've all sung songs that feel great. There's that song out, um, if he said it, we believe it. Oh, 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 oh. If he said it, we believe it. We can sing that. You know, we can, we can do the dance and, and, and we can walk outside and just go right back to a posture of filth and a posture of sin and a posture of woe is me. I'm a good for nothing. You, you know, you all know, I know the narrative. We know the narrative. It's, we've all been there at different times in our life. And I want to tell you today, church is not just a place where you need to come to kind of like, okay, let me get right with God again and then go through the week and fall into the mud and roll around and do the thing and then come back and get my injection again where I can feel like God loves me again. Guys, church, God loves you. He loved you before you were anything worth loving. He loved you in your darkest, most vile moment. I promise you, you're never going to earn his love. Amen. Pillar number one, you will never earn the love of God. You will never earn the love of God. And yet somehow we begin in love and we mature in our thought process. I'm going to mature and once I've matured, well, it doesn't work that way anymore. Now in maturity, I need to earn God's love. I need to, you know, memorize more verses. I need to fast longer. I need to pray long. We, we put all these things and we attach them to whether or not his pleasures over us are steadfast. His, his goodness, you know, continues to be over us. And what I've, what I've found ultimately is that the body of Christ at large is plagued with this issue. And this issue is we are begging and pleading God for things he's already given us. Begging and pleading God in our prayer, in our prayer life, in our praise life, whatever it may be. But internally, there's a cry, if we could only have this, whatever it may be. And I'm going to walk through a few things. But we're begging God for that which he's already given. And, um, you know, it sounds really beautiful. The prayers sound great. Uh, they sound very sincere. Um, but the Bible's clear, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And sometimes we come in a posture of unbelief, but with lots of tears, and we feel like we've given God the offering that he's looking for. And what he's looking for is for us to stand upon his word. Amen. Stand upon what he's finished and accomplished on our behalf. Stand upon what he has already seated in us according to grace. Yeah. And that takes us from being baby believers who weekly roll in the mud and weekly need a bath and weekly need to come back and, 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 and come back and, and never really develop and grow. It takes us from being those believers to those that can eat meat and stand and be those that populate heaven and plunder hell and break down principalities and powers because whether or not you know it right now, you are equipped to face off and square off with every principality and power that is wage war in this region. You have everything you need to stand against and to overcome right now, right now. Why? Because of the anointing of the Most High God, because of the presence of the Most High God, because everything you received being for life and godliness in the package that was given to you when Jesus declared, it is finished. We have to be aware of those tenses because so often when I say tenses being, it is finished, not it will be, not it is going to be, not most of it is. You got to look at the words and understand what he says is radical, Amen. like extremely radical, and it's yours. Amen. It's yours. Amen. Amen. So as I stated, you know, the, the, the first pillar of, of one of the things that we cry out to God for so often is love. You know, God, if you would just love me, if you, I just pray that you would be there for me. I pray that you would, you would help me out of, you know, whatever the situation is I'm in. And those aren't bad prayers, but there comes a place where we establish ourselves and say, Father, I thank you that you love me that you are mine and I'm yours. Father, that your word says that you brought me into a broad place and you rescued me because you delighted in me. I thank you, Lord God, that even when I was in my weakest state, you chose me and you sought after me and you had a strategy and a plan to win my heart and nothing has changed up till this moment. Do you see the difference between that posturing, 
So often what that posturing evokes is not a plea for more, it's a gratitude and a thanksgiving, which the thanksgiving and the gratitude establishes greater faith. Yeah, Amen? Amen. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved by God. You lack in nothing regarding love over your life. And what happens when you get this revelation is suddenly you're not the person in the room pulling and taking and taking. You're the person supplying yeah. and overflowing. You become the well that never runs dry. You become the overflowing river of living water. You change the atmosphere. Yeah. The only thing, the only thing hindering you <clears throat> from that revelation and that reality is faith. It's faith. And I just, I just pray that today, as we walk through several of these pillars, that there's just a grace released to grab a hold of it and to, and to understand it. Eyes that see and ears that hear. A spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that the eyes of your heart would be open to know the hope that he's called you to. That the heights, lengths, widths, and depths of his love would cascade so powerfully upon you, you will never be able to look back. You will know that you know that you know that not only you belong to him, but he is for you and he's not against you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Pillar number two, you ready? You're free. Amen. You are free. I'm not saying you're going to be free. <clears throat> I'm not saying you're working out your freedom. I'm saying you are free. Amen. Let's go to the word. Let's go to the word because I see some people going, mm. That's debatable. And why does it feel like a debate? It feels like a debate because we've elevated our experience over his word. Amen. And we've told Jesus, listen, what you've done for the earth was powerful, but what, you know, it, somehow I have exceeded the need for grace and it's gone beyond what you provided when you said it was finished which is ridiculous. When he said it, he meant it, and you were included in the statement. Galatians chapter five, verse one says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So often what happens is he, he, he cuts the chains or he unlocks, you know, the, the shackles and we step out and we breathe in that air of freedom. And for many of us, man, freedom's terrifying. We, we found our identity in our bondage. We're terrified to be identified as saints of the most high God. You know, the word saint was actually connected to the word hagios, hagios in the Old Testament was the very place where the manifestation of God's presence was in the Holy of Holies, the hagios of God. Hagios, holy of holies, manifestation of his presence. Paul looks upon his brothers and sisters in Christ according to the finished work of Jesus and declares over them saints of the most high God. Hagios, dwelling place of his manifest presence. And we want to present ourselves based upon some experience that now trumps what he has accomplished when he declared it is finished. Do we understand, church, when you present yourself before the Lord, do you understand that you're not only privileged and, 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 and permitted to say, Father, I thank you that these things are true, but the responsibility on your life is, Father God, I thank you that I'm a saint of the Most High God, that I'm no longer an instrument for sin, I'm an instrument for righteousness, and this is not just my, my you know, think happy thoughts, be a happy person, this is the word of the Lord of your life. It's what he accomplished when he went to the cross and he plunged sin and death, and all authority was stripped from sin in the grave. And Jesus rose and said, now my resurrection life will be your portion. We've for so long leaned on salvation as our insurance policy to heaven. Well, I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to be filthy and, and messed up all the days of my life. But at least I have my insurance policy. At least I know I get to show that thing and they got to open the pearly gates for me. And we've totally lost sight. We've totally lost sight of when he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm, the power of that statement. 
and what it implied that you possess, are a possessor of right now. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, beloved, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We're terrified at being identified with what he's identified us with. It's so much easier to say, let me identify myself. Listen, my, my great-grandfather was angry, my granddaddy was angry, my daddy was angry, and I'm angry. It's part of the bloodline. Sorry, it is what it is. You get what you get. Well, Believe it or not, that bloodline was severed the day Jesus came into your life, the day you were born again, the day you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, something radically changed in your life. You apprehend it by faith. You understand his word of your life and you reject, you reject the word that's been spoken over you, the narrative that's been spoken over you time and again. You give his word supreme authority. And guess what begins to follow? The evidence. We want to wait on evidence. Well, once I see, once I see these things come to pass, then I think I can start to hope and believe in it. No, it doesn't work that way. We walk by faith and not by sight. This is who we are. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Possibly one of the most terrifying verses in all of Scripture. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. A little compromise, a little bit of the flesh, a little bit of that thing, Lord, that I know you don't want me to have, but I desperately want to keep around. It will take you out. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Are we together, church? All right, let's go to Romans 6. My Bible says in Romans 6, dead to sin and alive to God. And it's talking about your presentation before the Lord. You are mandated by the King of kings and the King of heaven to present yourself as one who is in fact dead to sin and alive to God. I had no concept of this in my young years. I had no understanding. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't understand I had the permission or the responsibility. And because of that, guess what happened? I lived dominated by sin. Because I understood that I was not dead to sin, my understanding was I'm fully alive to sin. And because of that, every time sin knocked on the door, guess what happened? Come on in. Welcome home. But then guilt and condemnation, because I knew I was doing the things I wasn't meant to be doing, but I had no revelation of what he had perfected and finished in me at the cross. Amen. And one day, all of a sudden, the light you know, comes on. I read 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. And I began to think, wait a minute. I don't think I understand what this means. Started devouring the Pauline epistles and trying to figure out everything that was stated. And there is so much to be said for who you are in Christ Jesus. Yes, so many promises, so many verses. And if what I'm talking about right now seems like a total foreign language, I beg of you, read what Paul wrote regarding who you are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And reject forever, now and forevermore, the narrative of what has attached itself to you from this earth based on your identity. Reject the narrative of your experience and take the word of God and, 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 and lift it up day in, day out. Present yourself to the Lord based upon his facts, based upon his word. And I promise you, I promise you, you will never be the same again. Amen. Everything will change. It's the fight of faith. What shall we say then? And I'm going to try and cruise through here. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's not talking about heaven. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about today. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. His strategy for that expression and for that reality is you right now. And Jesus secured that that strategy would work when he said, it is finished and accomplished the work of the Father. You are the confidence the Father has right now that on earth, in, on earth as it is in heaven can be expressed today. It's because of what you possess in Christ Jesus. That's good news, Amen. church. This is not condemning message. This is wake up and grab a hold of everything that's been made available to you and let's stop begging God for the thing he's already given us. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. I want to make sure you know this is not my opinion, church. It's the word of God. The word of God is unbelievable. The fact that we would turn to anything else, the fact that we would consider waking up in the morning and tuning into any other narrative before first allowing this thing to position us. And this is not something you get one day and then you live in the rest of your life. It's a daily presentation. It's a daily resetting yourself. And if you don't do it one day, you could be in trouble. If you don't do it for a season, there's some, there's some gain, there's some ground to be regained in your understanding and, and, and what we give up to the enemy so easily when he has no authority and no right over your life. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Now, here's why I want to correct something. You, you know, church, you might be sitting here going, oh, I didn't realize we're going to get a sin message. Didn't realize there's going to be a sin talk. No, this, this is actually not a sin talk. This is a righteousness talk. This is me telling you sin and the narrative of sin and the, and the constant um, thought of sin consciousness should be so devoid of those of us who are called saints of the Most High God. You are an instrument of righteousness. We're going to read it right now. The presentation of your life should be so complete and perfected in what he has done that the consciousness of sin should be a violation to who we are. This isn't a sin talk. This isn't don't go and sin. This is a present yourself as who you are according to what Christ has done in your life. You're a righteousness man. You're a righteousness woman. It's who you are. Saint of the Most High God. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but you're under grace. Well, how does that work? Well, because grace is not just the package of pardon. It's the package of empowerment. It's everything you need for life and godliness. It's empowered you to do the full expression of Jesus as you're, as you're called to be on this earth. It's not, it's not just, thank you, Lord, that you've removed sin away from me. It's thank you, Lord, that you've imparted to me everything I need for life and godliness. That I have every fruit of the Spirit available in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control is readily available. And it's linked in. I'm grafted in to the very essence of all that that represents. It's my portion. It's, it, it is my inheritance right now. I'm not fighting against being an angry person anymore. That was severed from me the day that the lineage of Christ was put in my, in my bloodline. The Bible calls this the obedience of faith. It's the fight of faith. And for too long, we have given ground to the devil that was already established for you when he said 2,000 years ago, it's finished over your life. And we're begging God for ground. We're begging God for strength. We're begging God for the things that we already possess. 
And as I said, it sounds beautiful in song. But is it faith? What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. This is chapter 6, verse 15 of Romans. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. When you give your life to Jesus, you commit yourself to his standard of teaching, not your standard. Your standards have been obliterated. It's the standard of Christ. You don't get to decide what your standard is now. And he has lifted you to that and said, you're capable of fulfilling my standard. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you have no part with me. And they're like looking around going, the Pharisees, like their standards are crazy high. We can't even attain to that. But he did it tongue in cheek. He did it knowing. And I will satisfy that standard in you. My gift of my life will lift you to that standard. That's why he could say it with such confidence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're free. You're loved. You're free. Church, you're equipped. You're equipped. Not only are you loved by God and it's established, not only are you free, free of sin, free of torment, free of whatever has been given permission to identify itself to you that is not of God. In church, you are equipped, equipped. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 9, and I'm sorry, I'm, I know I, I gave half of these scriptures. I probably didn't give half of these scriptures. I'm the worst at giving notes. I've just looked at my notes for the first time and realized I'm, I'm all over the show. But some, something does happen, church, when you're no longer preparing to give a good message. You know, when the message has, has become who you are, when, when what's pivotal is a well-prepared heart rather than a well-prepared sermon. You know, when you understand that, that the, the life of the minister is not just about the right preparation for the moment you're given, but it's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle of presentation before Jesus based upon his word and what comes out, you have no handle over. It's not, you're, you're not controlling it. It's just the flow of God. It's the flow of the rivers of God. It's, it's what's promised to you. It's what he longs to see come out of your life. And your narrative right now is, well, that flow is, is prevented because of this, that, and the other. But the reality is those things have no authority to prevent what Jesus has established. And I desperately want you to hear this morning with me that God has established you on this earth today to be a, rivi- a, 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 a river of living water, a powerful well to your community, to your home, to your church, you don't have to be the person that shows up in a room and that needs and takes because you're, 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 you're living in a mentality of lack, but that you are overflowing with everything you need because of the finished provision of Jesus Christ. The provision of Christ is enough to fulfill your lack for the rest of your life. Amen. This is the word that I preach to the most remote villages of Africa. It's the same word. I, I speak this word to people who didn't have the finance to get past grade five. And therefore, the adults ended their education at grade five, most of them. I speak the same word. First Corinthians chapter one is one of my favorite verses to preach in remote villages of, of, of planet Earth because the gospel and what Jesus did is the ultimate equalizer on the earth. It levels the playing field. No longer does your college degree lift you up above another. No longer does your finance, no longer does your your lineage, how great or how terrible it is. It's the ultimate equalizer. It levels everything. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 9, it says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. So listen to this. Paul is saying, I give thanks because you receive the grace of God through Jesus Christ. His boast and his assurance to, to, to bring the message he's bringing is completely based upon 
you receive the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's what he's speaking to the church of Corinth right here. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and in all knowledge. Well, Jake, I, I, I failed public speaking. I've never been a great speaker. I'm terrified of speaking. I also hated public speaking. Um, I was terrible at it in class. I did not want to be a preacher. I did not want to be a speaker. None of those things are relevant. I hope, I hope you've heard this, and I hope you understand this, church. Your ability to administrate heaven has nothing to do with your natural tendencies or natural gifts. And in fact, let me even say this, many times naturally gifted people have a hard time flowing in the Holy Ghost because they're busy saying, God, I don't need you in this part. I'm really good at this. And it's why so often you have, the, you have people all the time stand up and testify, I was a terrible speaker. I sweated for, you know, hours before, you know, it was my time to stand up in front of people. I hated every minute of it. Well, you know, you actually can block the flow of heaven by the things that you think you're good at. I'm good at this, God. I got this covered, but I really could use help here. He's saying, no, you could, use your, you, you could use help in all the things, trust me, because my standard is not your standard. And what I believe and, and, and have set you on earth to do and to express is so far greater than what you can produce in the natural on any level, but it's available. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, which it's saying here, just make sure you are in Christ Jesus. You can't go walking these things out and put and putting a demand of faith to be the expression of Christ in you if Christ is not in you. Are you born again? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Verse seven, so that you are not lacking in any gift. Hallelujah. So that you are not lacking in any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus. So not only has he supplied in you everything you need for speech and and knowledge, not only are you not lacking in any gift, but it says you're a finisher. He will sustain you to the end, guiltless. Many times we think, well, you know, I'm I'm a great starter. I'm a terrible finisher. It's the way I've always been. Well, not according to the word. You will be sustained to the end, guiltless, at the end of your race, not just at the beginning. Amen? These are massive things. I see some of you looking at me excited and some of you going, I'm not sure what's being taught right now. But again, remember, as I said at the beginning, this is the posturing of faith. This is what you grab a hold of according to the word and where you labor, where you you become no longer Abram, but Abraham. These are marked moments in life where you realize, wait a minute, the promise of God over my life and the trajectory I'm on, the trajectory I'm on does not line up with this promise. And you go to your friends, you know, imagine Abram, Abram's first day saying to his buddies, hey, you can't call me that anymore. My, My name's Abraham. And they say, dude, you got an old wife that can't have kids and you want us to call you father of many nations? It's not happening. Imagine the assault against that man in the natural the day he began to open his mouth and declare what God had declared over his life, although he could not see it. We read it and go, ah, oh, Father Abraham, you know, he did the thing. He, 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 you know, he, he walked according to the ways of God and God told him to go and he rooted, up, uprooted his family and he went, although he didn't know where he was supposed to go and he called himself a name, although he couldn't see the evidence of it. And these are massive pillars to every one of our lives. To every one of our lives. Supplied by the finished work of Jesus. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, and then I have one more verse of scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. It says, his divine power has granted to us all things. Can you say all things, church? All things. I'm say it again. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us to his own glory and to his own excellence. How awesome is that? Do you hear that? You've been called to the standard of heaven. It doesn't matter what your standards are. He's not okay with your standards. 
He's not going to put up with your standards. His holiness requires and demands a standard that you cannot attain or obtain in the flesh. We must be totally and completely reliant on his spirit, on the supply of his life, on the supply of what his word has delivered to us, and we must walk in the anointing every day of our lives to live out the standard of glory and excellence, but it's available. It's available. It's not, it's not like being dangled on a car. Ah, you haven't done that 40-day fast yet. <clears throat> you may obtain to this standard when you finally memorize your 10th verse of Scripture, you know, or, or you haven't gone on a mission trip yet. How many missionaries end up joining the field because they actually feel they're lacking in, in, in their understanding of the love of God and they do it in hopes that he'll finally love them? Or in hopes that he'll find his, his pleasure will be over, or in hopes that he'll finally forgive them of the thing, of the stigma that's been attached to them for years, when the reality is they've been forgiven. They're fighting for a thing they already possess. Amen. The issue is faith. The issue is unbelief. Amen. Are we together? Verse 4, by which he is granted to us. Remember, it just talked about the standard. So it's saying, the way you live out this standard, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. I mean, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5 is the summary of everything I've spoken of. It is the total summation of everything I've relayed to you right now. Perfectly. Far better than what I've done. Just read it. Agree with it. Live your life according to it. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, saints of the Most High God. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. It just puts that little asterisk there like, oh, by the way, you've escaped. You've escaped. You're not one who is bound by any longer, because people, I'm sure, you know, that, that narrative of, you know, being, being a partaker of the divine nature, being one who actually expresses heaven on earth, being one who is actually seated, you know, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, being one who is, in fact, been given responsibility to be the expression of Christ to the earth. And then it just gives that little, that little side, you know, thing there, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Amen. So what does this look like? What does it look like to, to fight the fight of faith? What does it look like to administrate heaven in your life? What, is, what are the disciplines required? Because sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I feel like I'll get a concept from the Lord, but I don't know how to walk it out, you know? And man, if, if, you've, if you've ever read the book of James, we got to be people that have faith and walk the thing out. There's got to be expression our, our, our faith is revealed by expression in your life. If Jesus is <clears throat> king of your life, he will be seen in your life. There's no such thing as I've, I've, I've been a born again believer for 30 years, but he hasn't changed a thing about me. No, it means you're not born again. And I don't say that with arrogance. I say that saying, church, you must be born again. You must come to the end of yourself and make Jesus Christ I say make it. You have to recognize him as the king of the earth and of the heavens. As the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's who he is. You cannot live on a throne called Jake. You know, I can't live on the throne of Jake and express heavenly things. It just will never happen. The only way to be a carrier of the grace and the glory of God is you have to come to the end of yourself. <clears throat> I want to end in Romans chapter 12. And I want to give us an opportunity, if it's okay, to, to respond as well today. Romans chapter 12, such a beautiful verse 1 and 2, beautiful verse. It just says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, 
by the mercies of God to present your bodies <clears throat> as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I remember being at West Virginia Wesleyan in my dorm room and reading this verse again and again and being on the carpet as I was many times, you know, face on the floor crying out to God saying, God, make me holy and make me acceptable. Please God, please God, please God, please God. Because I so desperately wanted to be a spiritual act of worship. I wanted so desperately to be the very thing, you know, that, that he's talking about here. And there was a day as I was doing the same routine of just begging God, please God, in my sincerity and in my longing for him. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, read it again. I read it again. I felt like he said to me, read it again. I read it again. I felt like he said to me, read it again. I'm like, I'm obviously not seeing what you want me to see. <laughs> please tell me, please help me understand. And as I began to read it this time, it's like that lens just came off and I realized, can it be? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you would present your body, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, as one who is, in fact, holy and acceptable. Yeah. And I went, this changes everything. Stood up. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that according to your mercy and your grace, I have the ability to stand before you and present myself as one who is, in fact, holy and accepted through the beloved Jesus Christ. And it, it, it altered my whole world. Suddenly, I wasn't begging God for these things that he has established in me. Suddenly, I began to just thank him and have gratitude. And, and, and it, I remember that moment. I mean, it's like it was yesterday. It, the, the flood of carrying the weight of that which was no longer mine to carry of fighting a fight that was not mine to fight, of accepting a gift so great and so glorious that had such profound impact the moment I received it and realizing it had been available for so long. Amen. And there's Father looking at me, knowing my sincerity. I wasn't begging him for things. I wasn't saying, oh, I want a million dollars and I want the new, you know, whatever car because I'm so insecure, God. I need, I need these things outside of me to make me secure. And, you know, come on, God. I was saying, Father God, I want to be wholeheartedly yours and I want to be the expression of everything you've called me to. And he says, then receive it. And stand up and walk in what I've given you. And hear that you're loved and that I've set you free. I've given you a new name. I've not identified you in your sin and sickness and, 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 and vile nature any longer. I've identified you as a saint of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. I've equipped you to be the expression of my glory and righteousness on this earth. And I've called you, according to Romans 12, to stand before me and to present yourself as one who is a living sacrifice and one who is holy and is acceptable before the Lord. And guess what it says? If you do this, you'll become a spiritual act of worship. Why? Because you can't engage as a spiritual act of worship in the flesh. It looks beautiful. We come before, we can have tears streaming, but if we come in a presentation of flesh, it is not a spiritual act of worship. Amen. The word is clear. The only way, or in fact, it says it this way, it is impossible to please God without faith. Amen. We are a people of faith. We are a people who gloriously lift up the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are a people who say, far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and out of the world. We trumpet this reality. This is who we are and it's unashamed and it's why, it's why Paul would say things like, you know, Romans 1.16, you know, for I am unashamed 
I'm unashamed of this gospel. This, this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When he said unto salvation, he wasn't talking about insurance policy to get to heaven. He was saying the total liberation of everything that kept you in bondage so that you could rise up and be the expression of all God has called you to on this earth today. It is available. And he's saying, I will never be ashamed of this gospel. I'll champion it. I'll trumpet it for the rest of my days because it is the only way the earth gets touched with the presence of God. It's the only way people get liberated out of their bondage. I'm so tired of sitting in meetings in Africa where people sit with me and they say, we found the thing that's going to unlock prosperity to Africa. It's solar panels or it's clean water. It's whatever it is. Guys, the gospel is the only way. It's the only way. We don't have to change the narrative. We don't have to change the story. It doesn't, I don't have to contextualize it to modern day Christianity. The gospel of old is the word of the Lord to the nations, and it will always be his word. We're called to be servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God because it's not a mystery anymore. I used to sing those songs, you know, in my college years. It's a mystery. It's clouded, and I, it's, I can barely see it. And it's not. It's not a mystery. The mystery is gone. I should say the mystery has been revealed through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.27 says the mystery that the, that the prophets uh, and, and, and priests and kings longed for and gazed into and longed to see, we now see Christ in us, the hope of our glory. <clears throat> the hope of the standard being actualized, realized, and expressed to the earth. In us, Christ in us. It's the mystery. We carry it. We champion it. We stand every day saying, Father God, I cannot believe it, but I present myself to you based upon everything you've spoken over my life, every promise you've ever given. Because as it says in 2 Peter, the only way for us to express, express and, and experience this, this divine nature that he seated in us is through the promises. Hallelujah. Are we excited, church? We can bring maybe some of the worship team up. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive proponent always of responding to the Lord. Um, I, I highly dislike the church culture of sprinting out of a service where the, the weightiness of God is upon you. In us, in our indulgence-oriented culture, needing to rush off to the next thing that's scheduled when God's waiting to literally change your life. Literally supply to you all the things you've been longing and groaning for, but you have to... And I mean, listen, I, it, it, is, it is what it is. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the culture that we are in. It's, it's, it's the narrative that we have to battle with. And... And I get it. <clears throat> it's been nice living in Africa for about 20 years where time means nothing. <laughs> if you've ever been out in a remote village, they're like, uh, you got as long as you want. We're here for the next three days. And they mean it. They're like, we're not, we got nothing to do. You know, there, there's nothing going on. You preach and we'll respond and we'll talk about it after that. And we'll go right back into another meeting if you want to. <clears throat> it's exhausting sometimes. But I tell you. What we've talked about this morning, these are, these are heavenly matters that will confront everything that needs confronted and brought down in your life so that you can experience the freedom that is yours in Christ Jesus, so that you can experience the love of God, so that you can walk out as one who understands your equipping and, and, and utilize it, so that you can be one who actually plunders hell and populates heaven as a day-to-day -day just movement on your life. This is available to you. It's available. It's not, just for, it's not just for the apostles. It's not just for the evangelists. It's not just for five-fold ministry leaders. This is available to everyone named by the name of Jesus. You are a saint of the Most High God. You are identified by one who possesses the manifestation of the presence of God, the anointing. And our responsibility, the greatest responsibility we carry on this earth, servants of Christ, stewards of the mystery.
If you don't understand the mystery, we got to press in because it's available. There's no excuse for us. <clears throat> and the more we lean into this mystery, the more we lean into this reality, the more hungry we get, the, the, the more excited. I mean, I, I've, spent, I've spent 20 plus years of my life championing this reality. I'm not tired of it, church. I have more excitement in it. I'm more convinced of it. I'm more committed to it. Last year was a year for me because I felt like the devil confronted me and, and kind of said, hey, all the things you've preached, is it, is it real? And I, I, had to, I had to go deep in the things of God and, and, and go through my own battle to make sure I didn't become someone that just started to identify myself by my difficult experience. It was the first time in my life where I had to wrestle through some, some sadness, truly. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it, it really is. I, I'm, I'm an optimist guy, and, and when you're a Jesus guy, it's hard to not be an optimist because, I mean, church, hello, it's, it's unbelievable what he's done and accomplished on our behalf. But it was, a, it was a fight for me this last year, and I came out of that going, I will not give the devil one ounce of ground because of my experience. I will stand more fervently upon the word of the Lord and what I know to be true than I ever have before in my life. And that's what we're called to. That's what we're called to, church. So as we worship, I just want you to really be sincere before the Lord. If you do have something you need to get to, don't be condemned. Don't think, oh, Jake's gonna watch me walking out of here now and I'm, I'm that guy that has to rush off to something. But if God's speaking to you, don't rush off. If God's calling you to deal with some things, don't rush off. Amen. Let's stand up. Altars are open. If you'd like Brother Jake to pray with you, you're welcome to. Yes, I am the Lord God Almighty. And I've sent my son here today to speak the truth to you. Come, come out of this world. Come out of this world. I have great and mighty things for you. I have great and mighty things for you. Some will not receive this word this morning. Some want to stay in religion. Religion will kill. My children, I speak to you this day. Religion will kill. Walk out and leave, leave behind this world and the religion that wants to kill you. Hear the words of my son and fall upon your face before me. I want so much to wrap my arms around you and draw you close. I have so much for you. I have so much for you, my children. My children, my precious, precious children. You have no idea how much I love you. You don't have no idea the cross. You have no idea what I went through on that cross for you, for you, for you, and only you. Individually, take this word individually today. Today is the day of salvation in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Also, there will be ushers in the back and any gifts given will go to the ministry that you've heard. this heart. 
something I truly believe that goes along with what my sister said. You could just play softly. The Lord has been dealing with idols in the church, in our personal lives, idols. In your own personal time, ask the Lord, Lord, do I have idols in my heart? Is there anything that comes before you? I mean anything. I mean anything. It's easy to go to the Bible and say, yeah, they built this and they did that. We have built a lot of things. Our phones, food. And this is what the Lord said as, we, as she was, um, when she finished. She said, some people have time as their idol. Time is my time. I bow to my time. I will choose to give the time that I choose to give, but it's my time. And time can become an idol. And the reason why we can't hear a word like we heard this morning, the Lord was saying to my heart, is because we've been too fat. Too fat. Not in the spirit, but too dull in hearing because we're so distracted by time, by things. So when we get a word from the Lord like this today, it's hard to hear. Because we're waiting to go and do the things with our own time. And time becomes an idol. Food becomes an idol. God shared that with my own heart. Food, you run to it for comfort. What is it that we run to for comfort? If it's not the Holy Spirit, it's an idol. We can talk about addictions all day long. And yes, we have addictions in different ways. But God is dealing with the church to get rid of idols. He sent this word to let us know who we are. To let us know who we are in Christ. And how that comes is in the knowledge of him. It's the word of God. Is time an idol? And God's been dealing with me about something else. And I know it's just not me because we're connected. About fasting again. Fasting. Not because of God. Because so we can get rid of the distractions. So we can get rid of the, the cares that, that God is number one. And we can hear him better. Our sister spoke about hearing God and having a spiritual ear to hear. But we're so fat in the culture and the things that go on in our lives that we can't hear. Just hear the word of the Lord this morning. Get, get the CD, get the tape, get, get whatever, write down the scripture. If you're not writing down scripture when you're coming to church, if you're not writing down the word when you come, what are we doing with it? This is where the enemy trips us up because he knows when we don't know the word of God and there's no power and anointing behind it. Go ahead, Sonia.
Father, may we realize as the two sons in the prodigal son story, the one came back saying, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And Father, you restored him 100%. The other son said, I don't get much from you, Father. And the father said, all that I have is yours. Help us to realize what we have just by being your children. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.